before we get into the end game writing itself, uh, at, at one point in, in that writing of it, you point to the stack of projection letters that are, are right beside you. Uh, the Gallery 7 footage himself uh, by Dylan uh, is a little self-conscious sometimes, but the, there is one scene where you're reading Ode to the Things Themselves that sort of reminded me of that scene in Taxi Driver where uh, Travis Bickle is being rejected by this woman that he took to a porno theater for a date, and then it pans over to the street. Mm. Uh, it does, as you're reading Ode to the Things Themselves, which is a terrific uh, little sonnet, uh, it pans over to the rejection letters. And it, it has a similar effect of uh, just seeing this great writing being read and then the idiots that would reject it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I didn't think about that. But yeah, uh, Dylan, you have to remember too, uh, this is almost 20 years ago. This was a small little camera Dylan himself had on a tripod that he could take off. Um, you know, you can see the light sometimes overwhelms. It gives a kind of intimate feeling to the look, especially when you see me making asides explaining things. But, uh, you know, it, it was what it was. That was the era. Um, and, you know, I think it overall, uh, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting uh, couple of shows. But the real meat was me writing the poem. And I'd, for, for almost two decades, I'd asked Dylan here and there, and finally got it. I... He had it edited down to a 30-minute show, but he said that he he couldn't find for the life of him the actual show that he edited, so he just sent me the raw footage, which is about an hour and 40 minutes. And so from there, I put I put that whole thing up, basically unedited, uh, and then added in between uh, the writing. Every time I finished or basically got a, a line, each of the 14 lines, I would go back to the poem and have it come up so that you could see you know, that where, where the poem is picking up. And it's a, it's a sonnet, so it's, it's written in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, I agree with you that it would probably be much shorter if you didn't have to explain yourself and analyze why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, but it's, it's very much needed for the viewer. Um, well, he, here's the thing, too. Let, let, let me just, hold on, hold on, hold on. a factory going. Yeah, hold on, hold on. One, one thing is, uh, I think it's important, too, because uh, I think Jessica, or maybe you had mentioned it, that, like, there are films of Jackson Pollock doing his drip shit, um, but actually writing and... Also Yeah, well, actually writing and explaining the lines, and, and you, you can see me there uh, sometimes going, blah, 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 the something or other, and I say, no, no, uh, because uh is better because, and I explain why. There are certain things that are beyond explanation. I was listening uh, this past week to some of the songs of Alison Krauss. Uh, she ha has a bluegrass band called Union Station. And if you've ever listened to Alison Krauss, she has got the, I mean, everyone says she's got the voice of an angel. I would put her right up there with Karen Carpenter and Ella Fitzgerald and Judy Garland. She's one of, she's one of these just, you know, you could just listen to her sing the, the, the phone book. Well, if there were phone books anymore, but how could you how could you actually explain why a little warble in her voice makes a, a trite trite uh, song lyric into something memorable it, it you can't do it but I think actually writing uh, and, and watching this video I think it's much it, it's kind of mind-boggling that as far as I know I'm the only person that's ever done this I have seen videos on YouTube how to write a poem, and you'll see a list of seven or things like, don't be trite, don't do this, do this, do that. But the people who are doing that have no fucking clue what they're talking about. I, I, if, if, you, if you type in how to write a poem or how to write a sonnet, there's a, 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 there's a, a couple of videos. I saw a video of a couple of MFA guys talking about uh, sonnets and whatnot. <clears throat> but as far as I know... This is the only example of anyone really writing a poem, and especially a great poem, uh, on camera and explaining things. And the unedited version is so, I mean, it, it's so vital. It's hard for me to think of the, how there could even be an artistic video, a video on the arts and creative process that's more explanatory and more important than this is. I mean, this is really like a gold mine. And I, you know, and again, it's not me just trying to toot my own horn or whatnot, but where else can you see this? Yes, it would have been great had I been able to write uh, poetry itself 
or the passing's doing that, but, you know, it, it was what it was. When Dylan could come, and had he come the day after that, I might have done, you know, a poem on Joseph, one of my Stalin poems or, or something, you know. You, you hit a point in terms of sort of the ineffable qualities of it. Because you do explain uh, many things. And in, in a sense, every tick and mannerism is important in this video. Um, but there are lines where you'll just go uh, beginning to end. And you won't explain exactly why you've done that. But it just comes to you as, as you're writing it. Well, there, um, there, is the, there is the little miniature moments of inspiration. The whole poem was something that I cobbled together from lines and whatnot. But amongst them, there are going to be those moments where, like I, I talk about Alvin Lee and A Space and Time, and two or three times I reference that. I, 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 I twice reference Don Moss and his dislike of my within and without thing, and I say, fuck it, it's my poem. The, uh, allow, allowing yourself to be to just kind of create this template as you're beginning to write it is, is quite something as well. When most readers probably think of a writer writing, they just think of him approaching a blank, blank page. But that, there's much more complexity to it, and there was preparation, at least in writing the assorted lines that you had, or taking lines from it and adding it to it. Uh, one thing about the Ed Gein poem is you, you mentioned some of its qualities, but when we spoke uh, off camera last time, we mentioned how the line, and then there is life, is very similar to the effect that you have in. Norwegian, where Norwegian is basically the tale of Genesis with gangsters, and this is the tale of Genesis with a serial killer. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there are going to be, you know, like you said, you heard, you hear me in these 20 years ago, I talk, at, at one point I, I say, like, one of these days I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the metric fallacy, and it was three years or four years later that I wrote uh, Robinson Jefferson, The Metric Fallacy, that, that essay. So, uh, you know, you're going to see these things, and like you say, you're seeing a lot of things in utero uh, that, that would come later. Um, a lot of my approach to criticizing films or, or other works of art, you can see getting their first work out here. I mean, that's simply the way it is, and uh, uh, it shows a continuity of being and thought that, you know, almost two decades later, you know, I... I I've switched jobs a half a dozen times since then. I, I've changed states. I changed different, not only employers, but going into different, uh, different uh, types of, of work. Uh, uh, I I didn't know Jessica back then. I was a year year in, I was about a year from getting a first letter from Jessica. About a year and a half from meeting her, and then two and a half years from getting married to her. Um, and she, it was funny. Jessica said that. It was interesting because she liked being smarter than me because she knows the poem and she knows what line is coming. She's saying, I, I can watch you struggling there, but I know what you're going to say, you know. So she she's looking from the future back, say, you know, say, and that's an interesting because any anyone, because underneath all of these things, and I put it on my two YouTube channels, I put it on Vimeo, and I did an edited 30-minute version for a couple of people uh, on the e-list who are teachers who say they want to show it in their classrooms. And also this Daily Motion, the European version, sort of, of YouTube, uh, trying to get as much exposure out there. Um, because, again, I, I, this, is, this is, I think, this is right up there with some of the early films of the Lumiere brothers. If you're talking about import and how to be creative and want to, how to, to get things out, I don't see how anyone could watch this video and, and not be inspired by it. Yeah, you're going to have asshole trolls. Who gives a fuck about them? But I'm talking about kids like this chin, about some of these young writers, that kid Mohol, uh, uh, some of these, these young writers on the Cognoetica E-List. Watch that. Watch it. And watch watch it over and over. Watch the 30-minute edited version. Watch the hour and 40-minute version. Remember these things. Say, oh, I because if you watch it a few times, some of them might say, now, what did Dan do when he was stuck at something? He he went, he got the Vermeer book uh, and whatnot. Uh, and then you see, like, when I get the title, I go, uh, Ed Gein, uh, Ed Gein, Ed Gein Becoming. Ed Gein Becoming what? Ed Gein Becoming. Oh, there's the title. And then uh, the one thing that you don't see on camera, initially I had it uh, as being said in 1965. I changed it to 1968. But I, I do say in the video that I'll go over it in a few hours, and that's the change that I probably made a few hours later, if not the next day. 
And uh, as you're going through the process too of polishing it up, so you write it first, you make some adjustments as you go along, and it's a very linear process in many ways. As you incorporate the lines, some lines you don't use uh, for this template, and then once you get into your typewriter, you say, "Okay, watch, I'm going to polish it up a little bit," uh, and I'll explain why. And then you go through the process of adding commas, changing words around. Mm. Uh, it's it's a it's sort of like a, a a Fordism in many ways. It seems very simple, even as it's extremely difficult to do. Well, and and you you also see uh, that kid Shin mentioned that. I used an, uh, that I, I, I quote an opening line that I used for a poem called The Thin three years later in, in that video, which I didn't, I didn't you know, even recognize. Um, but, uh, y you know, you see, you see the things coming out. You see sometimes a, a whole line will just burst out. I'll, 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 I'll place lines and I say, well, I'm going to use the mellifluous light of evening at the end to parallel the mellifluous, mellifluous light of evening. But then you see me going, uh, the last three sentences of the poem, it, it's basically, I think, there's four sentences. The first 13 and a half or 12 and a half uh, lines are one sentence, and then it's three sentences at the end. And, 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 period. And and I talk about the, there's one line where I get the, the with, within the rhythm, blah, blah, I get, I get like seven or eight short I sounds. I talk about getting rid of the two beyond, one of the two beyonds that I, I originally have. So you see me holding places there. But even then, you and see... And also rejecting things. It's important to note what you reject and why. Take little asides of, this is too obvious. This is yeah. this would fit into a different poem if it was on a different subject. If it was Ted Bundy, I might include something of a higher ideal since he was an intelligent serial killer, but not Ed Gein. He can't yeah. take that. Well, and then, and then also the music, how it kind of develops. You say, I want to start off uh, very rhythmically, and then as it, as it goes along, you slanted lines uh, to kind of mimic the text that Ed Gein would have developed. And and there's a word grabastic that I say three or four times that I want to use, but I end up not using it at all. Um, and 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 so you, you see the whole plenum of, uh, of things, and you see me, like I said, making little asides, talking about Thomas, one of the lines saying that's Thomas Hardy-like, um, and why this is uh, that we have now Gein and uh, we, I, I want to get that. I, I talk about the uh, Vermeer thing, uh, trying to get uh, a, a perspective. Uh, silences that I, I talked early when I'm looking up the lines or looking up the stuff on Gein, how Gein apparently was a model prisoner. So when he has, he when he has a strict structure around him, he's a gentle, probably affable weirdo, but. When you take away the structure around him, he can't handle it, and he goes bonkers, which is an interesting thing. And so here's Gein becoming, his Gein in a quiet moment, a guy who's a total psychopath and, and, and off his rocker, and more importantly, psychotic more than even psychopathic, living in his own fantasy world of violence and whatnot. And, and yet we get this very quiet, almost Bergman-like portrait of this character. You could well, see, you could, you could you imagine Ed title, Gein in an in a Bergman type asylum. If you took out the title, it would it mean something completely different. Yeah, and I and that's a, that's that's an important the, point I mentioned. Uh, but I want to mention too one other thing in regards to that. Uh, using Ed Gein and then sort of making it not about Ed Gein works perfectly as well. That's that's what I meant mean by the titles, but also in terms of adding other things to it and imbuements that you start off with. You started honing in on a small moment of Ed Gein looking out a window. And that's really a good starting point, but there is no reference towards him looking out the window. That was an imbuement on your, on your own part. Mm. Uh, and it just developed from there. But it was that honing in on that one small moment and expanding it out. Well, I, I told you, like, when I've written my novels, a similar process happens. Uh, I was going to have the Lal character be much more important in the spy book. But as I wrote it, her her domestic situation with the spy, his domestic life, uh, didn't become as important because you know that the chance that a guy who's a worldly traveler, a guy who is making these life and death decisions, is just not going to end up with some hot young babe who's 
decades younger who just wants to be a mommy with this man who's much older. There's no way they can they can work together. So why have that element in the book? That uh, I mean, the, so it was much more important to give that character, place him in in the spectrum of 20th century geopolitics rather than his domestic situation. Because we can infer that that Lal and the super spy, even from the first two appearances, are not going to work out by the end. So let's just show them that they didn't work out. We don't have to get into the specifics. And in the same way, in much more micro, uh, we don't need to have the Vermeer-like moment of Gein looking out. Gein can just be sitting there quietly like... Uh, Anthony Perkins at the end of Psycho, you know, talking about the fly that's on his hand. I'm not going to hurt. I wouldn't hurt a fly. You know, so we can imagine Ed Gein just sort of smiling blankly in his room, maybe thinking about bacon sizzling or something. As a final point, uh, when people read your poems, when people read your novels, and when they watch this video, uh, to readers and especially to uh, incoming writers of merit, what uh, do you want them to take out of this? Well, uh, as as the subtitle of the the subtitle of the video says, you know, basically, don't wait for divine inspiration or any type of inspiration. Go and work at it. And I say it several times in in, in the video. You have to work at it. The biggest thing that I see is laziness in human life. People are lazy in all areas. They're intellectually lazy. They're physically lazy at their jobs. They're emotionally lazy. They want, they want, they want, but they don't want to put in the effort to get things. And believe me, I know that you can, I'm a perfect example of someone who's put in mounds of effort into something and not got anything. I, Jessica has, has railed about this too, that she, she, I don't think there's anyone, certainly not in the arts or in any human endeavor that I know of, who has done more of quality, high quality work in whatever field and for other people and gotten nothing from it. Uh, you know, and I'm not talking that I have to be, you know, a millionaire or whatnot, but just be able to have make a nice living by writing, uh, both Jessica and I. Uh, but we live in a time that that isn't like that. And it's because of all of the intellectual laziness. I see it at the school I work at and, and, and the, the idiotic, the idiotic uh, conceptions of how to teach children. Um, I see it in art with, with a lot of these people that I mentioned in this video from 20 years ago. Most of them are still alive and they're probably still just as bad. The Donald Halls and the Robert Blys and the David Moores. Um, the... A lot of these people are just phonies. They're lazy. They don't want to work. They just, you know, oh, I'm a, I'm a, a lesbian left-handed Eskimo. You know, let me just write about a novel about snow. Uh, it, it it's it's not interesting. You have to make fully rounded characters. Sim, I mean, identity art. The least important and the most boring thing about anyone <clears throat> is their quote identity. That I'm a white. That I'm white, that I'm male, that I'm American, that I'm an agnostic, that <coughs> excuse me, that I have blue eyes, that I uh, work this, that, or the other job, is not particularly interesting. They're just facts. Far more interesting is why I had wrote a book where I have a super spy meet an old man, a boy, and a bear walking along deserted railroad tracks. Why I might notice. Uh, a bug struggling in, on a floor where I just waxed yesterday and, and the bug is dying and I can't do anything to save it because if I stepped in the wax, <laughs> I, I'd ruin the wax job I just did. So I have to watch this bug just struggling there. It's, and, and that would be a perfect idea for a poem and I might use that moment sometime in the future, you know. Um, seeing your little dog in the background, you know, those... <laughs> Those are interesting moments. He, he's like looking over your shoulder. It's almost like it's a little conscience, from what I see, just looking over yeah. your shoulder. Um, but she's, she's eager to she. get out, so we shall yeah. call that an end. 